My name's Rebecca, for those who I haven't met. It's a real uh, honour and privilege to be with this lot up here today. <laughs> this is going to be a really interactive, solution-orientated session. Uh, we had the pleasure of meeting each other in person over, over breakfast and Dave's beautiful eggs this morning. Um, and I can see that this lot have got a lot to say about education for our planet, and so do a lot of the beautiful faces and people um, that, are, that are in this room. So how this is going to work is we've got 30 minutes of, of discussion amongst ourselves. Um, so let's just let rip and, and see what, what happens. Each of these beautiful individuals have got a great story and I'm personally really excited to hear it. Um, so do you, do you want to... Oh, you wanted to start, didn't you? I got the talking stick. Um, it's become quite clear from my perspective, which is I'm just a humble entomologist. I'm a little bit like Chansey, the gardener. Remember that movie? No, I don't either. Because it wasn't a time when I was living in the Netherlands. But that's another story. There were, that we have lost connection with nature in all sorts of ways. It's, it's, I'll just make it very brief. If you look at nature, you'll see that there are a lot of examples there that we fail to use in our community. Whether it is circular economy, ecosystem services, uh, uh, recycling, all that sort of stuff. And I've worked out that over the last generation, we've actually successfully raised a whole generation of kids now in virtual complete disconnect with nature. And when you reconnect that, like Julia did at Ipuni, you'll suddenly realize that you have the whole curriculum on one square meter of vegetable garden. And, and my challenge has always been, I can teach the whole curriculum in one square meter of that wonderful forest out here. So, reconnect kids with nature. How do you do that? Talk to kids. Fine, there's only one of me, there's only one of you, there's only one of you. We need to actually get nature literate teachers. How do you do that? You start with the culture of the school, boards of trustees, the, uh, the principals, and then what you do is you're going to take the teachers outside for a walk and you say nothing until the first question, and that is your teachable moment. And when teachers realize that, they realize that they can do numeracy, literacy, social studies, economy, art, music, and dance, because don't listen to whatever the STEM people say about science, technology, engineering, and maths. There's an A in there for STEAM, and that A is art, and also you know, your, 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 your engagement with these sort of things, and your heart, right? So when you get into the teacher training and you give the teachers the ability to use that outside classroom, which Ipuni has, by the way, the outside classroom made by Tremendous, which is exactly the model that we work on, to make outside class, outdoor classrooms at schools so that teachers can teach there, but give them the confidence and the resources to do it, you suddenly start stepping it up. That's an economic model just about. So... Oh, and the other thing is, of course, every person that wants to become a teacher and goes to teacher training college, or you infiltrate their lives too. When they know what the curriculum is all about, you say, now come outside with me for a week. Let's do this outside. And when they get this, they will never lose it. It is the reason you are here. You had all had a teacher or an influential person that taught you about respect, about nature, natural cycles, and all that sort of stuff. And we need to recreate that. I'm going to leave it at that. That's fantastic. Um, I'm Wendy Neal, and um, if somebody had told my 23-year-old self that I, worked, I would be working at a university, <laughs> I would have just laughed. I left school. Um, without any interest in learning on the, in that way. And I thought that if I was ever going to learn um, anything new, I was going to work alongside people and learn with them. And, um, and so what I do now is uh, more within the university, but uh, an apprenticeship style 
uh, learning where we learn uh, in a um, distributed way. Uh, we teach uh, what we bring with ourselves and um, uh, and based on the idea that it's it's similar to what Ruud is saying that uh, it's not necessarily the information that you remember from your educational experiences, it's the actual experience the, and the, the things that sit with you are the people that you work with um, the, and the uh, eureka moments that you shared with other people. Do you want to say a little bit more about Fab Lab work? And yes, right now, I, absolutely. I think it's interesting. <laughs> I promised Rebecca that when I got started I would never stop and that she would actually have to go like this. <laughs> yeah. So I, um, I uh, work at the university and, and it's uh, within a system that describes my job as I'm the director of the um, Fab Lab Wellington uh, and what I see is that I'm an, an initiator of the space alongside a really fabulous team and that's part of the Fab name. Uh, we're uh, part of a global network of digital fabrication um, spaces that are about innovation and changing the world. Um, democratization of digital fabrication is a, a big buzzword uh, in that um, uh, making um, like 3D printing, laser cutting, CNC machining, electronics programming um, accessible to um, a broader range of people. It's a, uh, as I said, it's a global network, and so actually that's a really important part of that is that there are um, about 600 fab labs now around the world, and um, we were um, lucky enough to join the network about um, three and a half years ago, and um, so we've been getting involved with all these people in 81 countries. So at the moment we're working with um, uh, a a fab lab in Alaska, which is really exciting for us because, um, as, a, as you can appreciate, in, in New Zealand uh, we're quite often separate from everyone else in the world just because of the time that we're awake. Yeah, and so we are, I often have meetings at three o'clock in the morning and everybody is just like really happy to see me, but I don't really contribute as much as I could. <laughs> Um, but with Alaska, they're 22 hours behind us, which means that they're two hours ahead of us. And so we get to have conversations every day about what we're doing um, and, and also uh, have conversations around that isolation and, and how we work with each other to feel connected to the global community. I stopped. Is that good? It's good. <laughs> <laughs> well, kia koutou. Um, firstly, uh, he mihi kia koutou. To the organisers of this amazing event, I'm really privileged to be here and um, kind of buzzing out on this geodesic dome a little. It's, it's really cool and it was really awesome to come to this whenua and so um, with that I, I acknowledge the, um, the home people here, um, Te Ati Awa, Ngāti Toa across the, across the bay in Porirua, um, Ngāti Tama and... Um, and also our kahangunu whanaunga from Wairarapa, um, and also um, the original inhabitants of, of Te Whanganui Atara, Ngāti Ira. And uh, I take that opportunity to acknowledge them because um, we are visitors in, in many circumstances. We are, we are inhabitants of a space that was inhabited by many others. And the story and history of the landmarks that are here in the land is an important piece that I like to start with because that's there's a story there <clears throat> and so I'm really interested in story and history and it all hasn't been nice admittedly um, but there is still a rich history here in this whenua anyway and I'm really interested in the natural wisdom that comes from the land if we take time to listen so um, I also want to acknowledge you, Julia, um, primarily because you just get on and, and get things done. And I really loved what you shared that, you know, at this point in time, you can talk about the outcomes that have come from what you have achieved in partnership with the, 
community. But in fact, it took 18 months for you to build trust. And I think that's a really significant piece of work that we can't just leapfrog over because in order to make the significant changes that are needed for the planet, for Papa Tuanuku Earth Mother, it takes time. And we need to engage as many supporters and people to be involved in that process, and everyone has their own story. So I acknowledge what you said as well, that um, the disconnection from the whenua is probably one of our greatest afflictions that are facing humanity today. And um, I, I reflect on, you know, at a time on my, on my ancestors, it was very natural to wake up. You were close to your family. Your grandparents, your pe- you know, your, your grandparents, your parents, your wider family were always close to you. Your members of your family were similar to what we have here on, on this um, piece of land, as people wanting to live close to each other to support one another. It was very natural. It was very natural to um, harvest kai or harvest food from the sea, from the river, um, grow your own gardens, and we did it together. <laughs> It was very natural. It was very natural to go out to the forest, to the ngahere, and gather your own medicines. It was very natural. It was actually not just natural to indigenous people, it was natural to all of humanity, actually. We were very much connected deeply to the whenua. We listened carefully, and our bodies were in sync with the land as well. And so I think about that. And then I think about everything that's happened, you know, so if we leapfrog over all the things that have happened in the world and we're here today, and we are in a very fast-paced, techno-centric, economy-centric, grow, grow, prosperity um, space, which is consistently putting Papa Tuanuku, our Earth Mother, in a place of distress all the time. And I appreciated what um, the brother said, that, you know, at one stage, his understanding was that you flush a toilet, it's gone. You throw your rubbish in the bin, it's gone. You don't have to think about it. And we're lucky here in Aotearoa. We've got a relatively okay system that gets stuff out of sight, out of mind. So we don't have to think about it so that we can continue to work, to make money, to feed our families. So I was actually intending to come here to talk about um, Indigenous education and the prospects for cultural survival. But I'm also mindful to um, stay apolitical, so I'm not going to go too deeply into that. Um, But I could go on forever about the impact that colonisation has had on Indigenous peoples worldwide. Yep. So I just want to make it a given that that's potentially a known fact to to the participants in this room. What I do want to note, though, is as part of a cultural regeneration and restoration, um, many activities that are happening in communities is all about connection and all about reconnecting. And in, um, in the Māori community that I've been privileged to be part of in the far north, in the Hokianga, um, we partnered with two beautiful women that are permaculture designers, and together we created a story with a community that, again, higher statistics, low in unemployment, poor health, poor, you know, we could, we could go on forever about that. But what we did is that we decided that we wanted to reframe the story, and we wanted to reconnect to our own personal history. And what connected us as whānau, as family? What were the blood ties that brought us together? Who were our ancestors? What did they do together? How did they cooperate and share? How did they grow their own food? Because again, in this community, there's no shops, but everyone goes to pack and save in Kaitaia, which is a 45 minute drive to get their food. No one grows their own kai, or very little families do that anymore. Um, Shearing had disappeared, um, and there was a lot of competition and theft between families. So when you've got that as a potential reality, how do you reignite a, an, an old way? Not a new way, actually, but an old way of community. And so what it is that Julia has been able to achieve with an ipuni, I think is a significant feat for a range of reasons. One, the people there aren't necessarily related to each other. And you can get a lot of capital buy-in from families when you're related. But when you're not related, that's a significant difference. The second one is in a rural community where everyone's related, there's a 
possible mutual story that we can work off. And therefore, we can be inspired by those stories and use that as content for our learning. So that's interesting, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything. Because the third part, which is just as important, is we need to get in and do a something. Now, we can talk forever, and a majority cornerstone of our culture is kōrero, is talking. However, moving from the kōrero to mahi, to actual work, is the critical piece. That is a critical linchpin. And therefore, any programs, initiatives, must go at the flow and be at sync with the community that we are working in partnership with. And that comes with building trust, that comes with developing our stories. Um, but that's, it's also as simple, and I want to acknowledge Rosie, um, who is here in the room, because she was working with us as a, as a group of um, diverse leaders from across New Zealand on Waiheke Island, and the simple practice that she did was take time to listen to your breath. Take time to listen to the sounds of nature. Make a piece of art with, with nature, with branches and leaves, and tell your own story. And I'm, I'm sharing that because it's really simple activities that can enable people to become better connected with nature. And I'm also a firm believer, though, that until we reconcile our relationship with Papa Tuanuku, it's going to be very difficult for us to reconcile our relationship with each other. And so how do we do that? Yeah, so maybe I'm just kind of posing a lot of questions um, for us to think about. Because, um, yeah, I had a whole lot of stuff here about, um, about our story here. But one of the things that we are trying to reclaim, particularly when we are reclaiming our own traditional methods of knowledge and knowledge exchange and wānanga, that's, you know, the space of learning, is through... What's more, it's not even about we have to put everything on pause still and return to a way of old, because there are ways of old that work, but it's also about how do we maintain our cultural survival in amongst all of this busyness, in amongst all of these social pressures and commercial pressures. And that's, and that's a challenge that we are having to have um, within our own families about what does this all mean for us. And it is about um, reconnection and reclamation. It is about educating our young people to remember. Some of them might not even have a memory to refer to when it comes to nature. And so how do you build that connection and understand the, the modi, the life force that exists in all things? Um, because the outcome is how do we reignite our obligations as kaitiaki, as guardians, of which we are actually all responsible responsible of upholding. And so, yes, as Indigenous people, we have a story, we have a connection, we have practices and behaviours that reaffirm this connection, but that is not something that is just strictly for Indigenous people only. I feel that that's something that we all as human beings have a role and responsibility for. And so, therefore, how do we do that too? So, yeah, there's a lot of trauma there's a lot of healing that's needed. I don't have any answers and I didn't want to come here with any. I have more questions. And that is how might we step outside ourselves and um, indigenize ourselves as people to better connect with Papa Tuanuku. Kia ora tato. Thanks very much, and actually that's a really good segue, um, I think, into a discussion that I'd like to have. Um, and and that is, firstly, just, just to thank you for the diversity of this discussion. And as a strategist, I'm really delighted and excited when I see discussion about a certain topic, which is education for our planet, across all of these scales. We've gone from bugs to insects to products to 3D printing to indigenous and ancient wisdom. Um, and, you know, sort of the, the micro to the, to the macro and how do we as kaitiaki um, of this country and, and our planet weave together the future of education um, so that we are creating a future which is, which is fit for future generations. 
Um, so one of the questions that I have is, um, as well as being obsessed about moving across scales, is finding these leverage points where one small change in one thing creates a big change in everything. And just hearing this panel and, and this discussion, I'm thinking, where is the leverage point of, for education? What, where are some of the areas that have triggered um, we, we would see many beneficial outcomes for New Zealand. And what I'm thinking is there isn't one leverage point, that it's a collective impact approach um, and that the beauty of collective impact is you're amplifying the good work of others and, and not replicating it, um, ensuring that we are educating from many different um, perspectives. Um, but there's some central facets of that which we need a shared vision of where we're going to, a shared way of measuring that, um, and mutually reinforcing activities so um, the activities are amplifying each other and growing in strength. So my question to anyone on the panel really um, is where are the areas of synergy, um, specifically in education, that if focused on we could see um, impact at the scale and pace the world needs. So those areas of synergy or those mutually reinforcing activities. Yes, yeah, when you say pace, um, I, Rebecca, that's kind of interesting for me because you're also talking about, you know, the high tech, the high speed, all that sort of thing. And, the, uh, you know, obviously I'm fully engaged in a, in a digital, you know, space and my biggest job is to slow everyone down, you know, to just, for them to think. You know, you know, it, it's not enough to want to do something. You know, you need to know why. Why are you doing it? And and what what meaning? Ha Especially, you know, I work in a design school, and everyone goes, "Oh, I've got a solution. I've got a solution." And I go, "But there's a reason why there's no square wheels." You know, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something. And um, you know, a lot of our practices uh, around um, uh, you know not wasting, uh, about um, having a closed cycle with our materials, uh, imagining where your materials come from. Um, we do. We have our worm farms, and we have our um, compost from our kitchen space and our kitchen space and eating, as we all know, eating together, as a as a time when you um, talk and uh, you connect. And sometimes that's when your best ideas can come together or when you're actually not thinking about what you should be thinking about but just enjoying each other's company. So the pace thing for me is uh, that we want to be fast but in, in some ways uh, we can be faster if we can be slower. Yeah, and the slow food movement can tell us that too. Great, thanks for that. Anyone, anyone else want to comment? No, totally. It's, it, it, it is exactly the way it is. Um, I, I go a different way. I always talk about reconnecting kids in a digital, uh, to, with nature in a digital age and make the point that I'll never be your friend on Twitbook. Um, <laughs> that's, it's got to be like that because you've got to start off looking at your, your mentors, your mentors outside, you know, whether it's the land. And then if you, if you want to know something, this is what they call inquiry learning. You see, the curriculum doesn't need to change. It's fine. It's the way you approach the curriculum in an inquiring mind. Kids are really good at that. They ask the question, why do mosquito spiders? Why can't we get rid of mosquitoes? And you tell them the stories, you know. Of course we can get rid of all the mosquitoes and the Zika virus. And it was no problem. Well, we got all the chemicals and shit we can spray. That's good. But you have to remember that the male mosquitoes do all the pollination of the flowers. And the little wrigglers actually clear the bacterial soup in the bottom of the lake so that the moose in Alaska can dive down and see where its plants are. And these same little mosquitoes have food for little fish, which have food for bigger fish, which have big, bigger fish. And then the bear smacking the salmon out of the waterfall, which we all see on David Attenborough. You know, without these little mosquitoes, there is no bear smacking salmon out of the waterfall. You see, and there's no ospreys. So, so all you need to do is donate one tiny droplet of your blood to fuel the whole damn ecosystem. And I want to hear stories from all the people that have lived on this land anywhere in the world because those are the stories that bring back that respect and the time to think about it without assessment, without having to fill in 
200,000 osh forms when you want to go outside on a field trip in a risk averse country. I'm leaving it at that. Kia ora. Um, I, you know, I, I can't get away from just real simple wisdom, you know, like simple wisdom, just being able to sit at the foot of our old people and, and ask them what they remember. You know, I appreciate what you said, that there's like a myriad and multiple ways of creating change. And, and there's that really interesting piece of education. But then I, I look at, if I peel back education, it's like, well, through whose lens are we looking at? What frames are we using? And I'm, I'm just conscious that it's been such a long time, particularly as a, as a Māori woman in Aotearoa, that you know, I've had to do a lot of um, digging of myself, into myself, to understand that I have received a certain education, which, infor which forced me to think a specific way, of which my parents also thought a specific way, which enabled my parents to survive as labourers here in Aotearoa. So it was no longer useful to understand how to gather your own medicines. It was no longer useful um, or even honoured wisdom, these old traditional wisdom pieces. So therefore, um, I encourage people that I work with is ask your old people for their wisdom. Ask your children what they think. And just the simple things of just getting into the water and swimming in the sea and diving for um, kai if you eat one, of course, but those simple actions are, um, are also significant activist actions as well. Because again, in that, pl in that place, we are starting to uh, get rid of some of the thinking that's been imposed upon us and starting to reframe what that might look like. And so I believe that the education starts out with a question. What are the questions that we're going to ask ourselves mm. and each other? And how might that enable us to better connect with the natural world? Mm. And just before we throw it open as well, just what you were saying just then was, was really triggering in me, you know, what is it that we're seeking as kaitiaki of this land? What are the outcomes that we want? I mean, there's certain issues and ideas that are in... Um, either crossed over tipping points of what we think is safe for humanity or, or are close to, you know, issues such as um, climate change, what's happening with our nutrients, biodiversity. Um, and there's six other, others that are, you know, nearby. Um, but what I'm, as in near to, near to tipping point um, within those planetary boundaries... Um, what I'm hearing is perhaps there's not a need to focus on particular issues, um, but more of a, a slow, careful um, questioning approach um, out in nature so that we can understand a whole range of issues which would give the same sort of solution. Do, you, do you have, anyone have a comment on that? Or whether we should be looking specifically at certain issues of our environment if New Zealand is to move to a place of prosperity? I'm going to share a very brief story about Kaitiaki Tanga in action. <clears throat> so I went to the Chatham Islands, and um, has anyone been to the Chatham Islands? Yeah, it's pretty beautiful down there. Yeah. So I thought I'll go for a run because I'm training for Iron Māori, right? So I thought it'll be awesome. I'll go for a run up the beach, and I'm running up the beach, <clears throat> and there is plastic and bottles and rubbish everywhere, all up the beach. And I'm thinking, so the first thing I thought, well, I'm, run, you know, I'm walking because I want to walk as far as I can so I can run all the way back. So I'm walking and I'm stepping over plastic and I'm getting around bottles. And I was like, it's not my funeral, I'm not from here. That's my first thought. Yep, I'm not from here. The second thing I thought, Father Paruez, man, what's up with this? I'm getting pissed off, right? So I'm getting angry at all this plastic and shit. And the more and more I go up, I'm getting more and more angry. And then I'm walking more and I just said, right, that's it. I'm going, to, I'm going to put a campaign. So I had just arrived in the Chatham Islands. This is day one, right? <laughs> so I said, right, that's it. I'm going to put a campaign on Facebook and I'm going to say, everyone here, I want to encourage you to get down on this beach and we'll do a beach, beach cleanup. Yep, so I'm still only maybe 500 metres up the beach. It's my <laughs> third thought. 
The first thought then, uh, the fourth thought that I got to was like, fuck, right, I can't just not do my role as a kaitiaki, yeah? Because even though I'm not from here, I still have a moral obligation as a human being to do something about it. So I'm walking still, and then I realise, you know what? Because I took photos, of course, as I went. I was about to, you know, shame them on Facebook. <laughs> and then I realised quickly, you know, actually, what right do I have to point fingers at these people here if I think about the amount of waste that I personally produce, me, if I was to put all the rubbish that I create in my, in my life and I was to lay it up at this beach, that whole beach would be covered with all the waste that I personally produce. So then I started to shift. Then I started to look out at the water and I realised there's heaps of boats out there. Um, there's a fish factory and there's a lot of behaviours that need to change, particularly a fisherman that just dumped their plastic. So remember, I'm still walking up the beach and I'm having all these thoughts. So then I turned around and I thought, okay, well, I'll do my bit. So I took my jersey off and I walked up the beach and I tried to carry as much rubbish as I could off the beach. I dragged it, two Ks, um, big netting, rope, plastic bottles. But you see, every piece that I picked up, I had to leave pieces behind. And I realized, shit, I can't, I can't do this by myself. I'm not from here. What do I do? <clears throat> so I kept walking and then I get back to the house that I'm staying at and they see me dragging all this rubbish and I have a rant. But I realised in that, in that moment that there were three things that I needed to think about. One was, there must be a strategy here, which must involve the community and must be community-led. The second thing is, I wonder what it is that they already do. This isn't an issue that is faced by myself, and I need to talk to people. So I was there for five days, and instead of me putting it on Facebook and, you know, doing a hucker about it, I started to talk to the locals. And I asked them, well, what is your thoughts about it? And they said, look, you know what? It impinges upon our ability to be kaitiaki of our own area. Because all of that rubbish that you see there, it all comes from New Zealand. It all washes up on our shores, so we can't do much about it. Our school goes and does a clean up, but again, who pays for that? And I think to myself, you know, all these fishing boats, $1.89 million is derived from Chatham Islands alone in fisheries. A small percentage of that could be invested in a uh, rubbish program and encouraging children to think differently about their waste and fishermen. So the final part of the story, sorry team, is that one of the local women, after hearing my story, picked me up and took me to the rubbish dump. And there were mountains of rubbish on Chatham Islands because they have to import all of their stuff off the mainland. So the story, the, the moral of the story is I don't think that anything is as simple as we might think of it. And we must be very careful about not trying to be do-gooders, be mindful about where our anger might take us. Um, and, I, and I chose not to um, publicise those photos. I decided I'm, I'm actually going to work in a different way. And so every single stakeholder that I met with for that whole five days, I talked about that. And so now the council are going to put a big sign up on the beach, which says... How can, um, you know, our, our role is kaitiaki. I love this beach. You know, so it's not they don't leave rubbish, but actually share your, show your love for this land by doing your bit. And that's it. Nice. Thank you.